very good afternoon to all of you. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. So we will start. I think all the panelists have joined now. So on behalf of uh, Science Foundation and MHRD Institution Innovation Council, the Indian Upadhyaya College, I welcome all of you in the Science Academy's online lecture workshop on frontiers in science and engineering opportunities for graduate. This is a five days program starting from today. And uh, I've already emailed the detailed technical schedule for each day. So we'll be having at least one or two talks every day. And today we have with us uh, Professor Anurag Sharma, who's the convener of this workshop, the fellow of all the science academies, and who is currently JC Bose National Fellow, Department of Physics, IIT Delhi. And you also have with us Professor J.P. Kurana, who is our first speaker, and my co-host, Dr. Gitika, and other members who will be joining us subsequently during this session itself. So before I ask uh, Professor Anurag Sharma to give a brief about the whole program, I'll just give an overview of the activities which have been organized by us in past. So in last 10 years, uh, we have organized several workshops with the financial support of uh, CSIR, DBT, DST, and the Joint Academies, that is Indian National Science Academy, National Academy of Sciences India, and Indian Academy of Sciences. Uh, this goes back, uh, the first one, which was there in the year 2011, uh, when we organized a lecture workshop on frontiers in physics and followed by our lecture workshops on frontiers in science and engineering, that is in 2012. Then the third one was on history, aspects, and prospects of electronics in India, that's in 2012. Thereafter, we got support from CSIR to organize the lecture workshops on transdisciplinary areas of research and teaching by Shanti Saru Bhatnagar awardees. And we have been quite successful in organizing uh, these lecture workshops. The first one was in 2013, followed by in 2015, then 2017, and the last one was in 2019. And the last two, they have been supported by the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. So in this program, uh, we have with us 12 eminent speakers who will be sharing their expertise and knowledge with all the attendees, the students, and faculty members uh, who have registered for this uh, program. And uh, the first one will be Professor Anurag Sharma, who will be talking to us, first introducing about this whole workshop. And later on, we'll be having a talk by Professor Kurana. And then at 7 p.m. by Dr. Dinakar Kanjila. And this is the technical program schedule for today, for September 15, 16, 17, 18th, and 19th. And I request all the attendees who are attending this program to kindly do fill up a feedback form, which will be shared during the session itself. This will help us in improving the quality of the program and all of the subsequent programs which we intend to organize later on. So let me introduce Professor Anurag Sharma, uh, who joined the faculty of the physics department in IIT Delhi in 1980, and is presently JC Bose National Fellow, so Department of Physics, IIT Delhi. Professor Sharma received the Young Scientist Medal, 1986, AK Bose Memorial Award, 1991, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, 1998, MN Saha Award, 1999, and SK Mitra Memorial Award, 1987. He was elected Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences in 1998, Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, then Optical Society of America, and Indian National Academy of Engineering, 2009. And he was Associate and Senior Associate of the Abdul Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics, Italy, and is presently the President of the Optical Society of India. Uh, with these words, I request Professor Anurag Sharma to kindly address the audience okay hi good good afternoon to all the participants professor khurana who is present here and uh, is the next speaker 
Dr. Manoj Saxena, Dr. Geetika Saxena that I can see on the, on the uh, panel right now, uh, and many others uh, who are present. Uh, so welcome to this workshop, uh, which is being uh, organized uh, as a panel of uh, from the academies. And uh, it's a one day, I mean, several days workshop on frontiers in science and engineering opportunities for graduates. So I expect that large number of participants would be actually students who are science graduates or uh, and number of teachers from there. So uh, the whole idea of this workshop, as I understand, is to, uh, of course, the talks are for in all the subjects in science and engineering. And that is why the whole idea is to uh, expose the students and the other uh, young scientists to a multidisciplinary uh, aspect of the uh, science and engineering uh, so that one can have a cross fertilization of ideas from one to the other. And it's extremely important in today's world because uh, uh, the disciplines are merging at the boundaries and slowly uh, fusing into each other. So we have all kind of uh, names which have been there around and new names like biophysics or biotechnology or, or medical optics or biophotonics or you know, all kind of combinations you can actually make uh, uh, biochemistry and so on. Uh, where uh, these subjects are merging and it's extremely important that uh, students have not only the uh, uh, training in their own discipline but also have a fair amount of knowledge of the other areas so that with that view this workshop uh, has been planned and that is why uh, the uh, lectures are in almost all subjects spread over i think six or seven days and uh, uh, every day we have i think two lectures which is a which is a good thing in the sense we are not overloading the students I and mean, one could have had workshop in two days all the lectures together but i think this format is is more relaxed and people will understand a little more uh, the grasp will be more so with that uh, few words i i welcome you all again to this workshop and uh, then manoj had told me that i have some 30 minutes so out of which i think five or ten minutes have already gone so we'll have about 20 minutes to introduce something which uh, uh, which is close to my heart and uh, which is a very interdisciplinary subject actually the, the 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 work that i do is 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 rather interdisciplinary it cuts into several engineering and sciences so uh, let me uh, give uh, a little overview of things so let me share my screen here Host has disabled, disabled the screen, by. Just a second, sir. Yeah. Well, I'll, in the meantime, I would like to thank Manoj uh, Saxena uh, profusely for uh, doing the entire work for this workshop. I mean, he has been at it, you know, uh, with the change of platform and all kind of things are happening and a very dynamic world these days and uh, of course he's supported by Geetika also and many others and uh, so I thank all of you uh, Manoj and his team for organizing this workshop which is extremely useful I'm sure you would like. Sir you can try now. I yeah. know I am the host okay fine <laughs> uh, all right so is that visible now? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. How do I go side by side? All right. That's okay. So, uh, okay, let me go back. Uh, so, what I'm going to talk about, uh, about light uh, that I uh, play with, I work with. And uh, so, we have focus on light now, you know. Uh, usually, use light for focusing. So, I'm. we have focus on light. So here I show you a screen full of great men of recent history, uh, recent or not so recent, and uh, most of them are no more except uh, Dalai Lama who is going strong and 
may have lived long. And uh, so all these people have, if you look at this, this, these two are in the literature, and then these are all in the public life, politics, and these are all scientists. So, you know, uh, these are the peop great people from uh, various uh, spheres of life and uh, work, and they, they have contributed in their own spheres uh, such that the, 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 uh, their particular area has changed after their contributions. And they've all been well studied, well read, they've all been writing, uh, have written uh, various literatures and so on. So, but apart from that, what is common between them? So if you really notice, the common thing between them is the spectacles. All of them are wearing spectacles. The, uh, of course, most famous spectacle in our country is, of course, Gandhi's uh, pair of spectacles, which have been uh, used left to right for all kinds of things. And of course, uh, if you look at the, uh, Gandhi's uh, sketch, if you just make a small round and a spectacle, you know it is Gandhi. So that is the iconic spectacle, spectacles that uh, Gandhi have had. And these are the, uh, this is the picture of the original uh, Gandhi gold-plated uh, spectacles that he, had, he used many, for many years. So these spectacles are invaluable aid to the vision for a uh, variety of people. And in fact, all these great people towards the later years of their age, they could not have contributed if they did not have this aid because they were all uh, uh, avid uh, readers and writers. And of course, unless you have a physical vision, which is aided by uh, this kind of spectacle, you can't have a vision of life and vision of what they're going to create. So spectacles, if you see, uh, this is from the uh, Vision Council of America, approximately 75% of adults in the world use some sort of vision correction. About 64 of them wear glasses, eyeglasses, and 11% contact lenses either exclusively or with glasses. In India, the situation is not that good. Uh, it is estimated about 35% of population, which is uh, 3.5, 35 crore people, uh, are in need of vision correction, which may be done by spectacles or contact lenses. However, only about 25% of this, that means about 80 to 90, uh, have actually their vision corrected. So spectacles, uh, are you know uh, the simplest, simplest optical instruments that have been serving the humanity very widely and for centuries. I mean, I sometimes say it is it was almost like a you know uh, invention of the wheel that we have uh, these kind of eyeglasses. Otherwise, half the humanity would not be able to see clearly. So the lenses, although were known for uh, from the, since the times of Greek, but the real eyeglasses appeared only in the 13th century. And this painting, uh, which is the oldest or the earliest painting, which shows a spectacle, uh, is 1352. So the lenses uh, which were used in the uh, uh, spectacles were uh, studied uh, and fairly well understood by the end of the 16th century. But what is surprising is that it took 200 years for people to put two lenses beh one behind the other to get a magnification, which is very, very surprising that, you know, people have been working for lenses for two centuries and it's only in 1590 when few Dutch spectacle makers experimented with a combination of two lenses to obtain a three times magnification and that's a microscope was born. And this news of microscope reached Galileo in Padua, Venice, which where he studied uh, these uh, combinations of lenses and not only improved microscope, but also invented the, the telescope. So since then, that was the beginning of optics and optical engineering. Since last four centuries have been extensive, uh, have seen extensive uh, development of, in optics and optical engineering. These were accelerated many folds after the invention of laser in 1960. And of course this year, as you can see, we are celebrating 60 years of lasers. So if you look at, the uh, developments over the last four centuries, you cannot think of astronomy without a telescope. You cannot think of biology and medical science without a microscope. And you cannot uh, 
look at this science and physics or chemistry of molecules and materials without a spectroscope. So these instruments have been working silently, uh, enabling all kind of technologies, all kind of science, and without much glory to them. I would say that. More recently, uh, the world of internet has grown in the last 25 years or so. And so much so that the social media, low cost telephone calls, video conferencing, the one we are doing right now with family and friends. These are three examples of how the internet allows people around the world to feel connected in a way that has never been before possible in the history. And all this technology is because of light. So the uh, lifeline of the internet is the optical fiber. And what gives light, what gives life to this li is, is light. So if I look at this light, we have optics, which is the science of light. Then we had coined a new world called photonics, which is science and technology of life. This happened after the invention of laser when the technological applications grew. And today we are witnessing, as we say, photonics revolution, which is changing lives of people through various interventions and te technologies. The world took note of that and International Year of Light and Light-Based Technologies was celebrated in 2015. And uh, after the success of that, it was decided that the International Day of Light will be celebrated every year on May 16th. May 16, 1960 was the first laser invented. So the photonics revolution, if you really see that on the most fundamental level through photosynthesis, light is really necessary for life on earth. Everything is, all the energies, everything is coming from the sun. And that is how we have light from this. But more recently, many applications of light have revolutionized society through medicine, communication, entertainment, and culture. Light and photonics are poised to become key enabling technologies of the future. All over the globe, people are using light to discover solutions to society's most pressing problems. From 3D printing to bringing energy solutions to developing regions, light is the key in driving economies and encouraging the development of civilization. If you look at how optics contributions have been recognized by Nobel Prizes. There have been 18 Nobel Prizes in physics in the last 120 years to given to 30 scientists. Out of these, if we do the analysis, till the lasers now, you know, Nobel Prize is now 120 years old and laser is 60 years old. So you can divide the part in two parts. So up to 1960, when the lasers were invented, only four Nobel Prizes in physics were given to optics related work and 11 uh, and 14 later after this. So in the first 60 years, four, next 60 years, you have 14. So that's the impact of lasers. And one Nobel Prize was in chemistry, which was in 2014, and one in medicine. And 2014 has the distinction that both physics and chemistry Nobel Prizes went to optics-related subjects. So what are the main application areas? Energy, health, communication and electronology, I'll just briefly touch upon this. In energy, there are two types of uh, contributions which photonics is making. One is little long term, which is in terms of fusion. So laser fusion is something being, uh, which is being pursued for making a, a sort of fusion un under uncontrolled conditions so that a large amount of energy can be harnessed. But more currently, we are using solar energy, which is also a form of optical light coming from the sun. And uh, through solar cells, this energy is being, is, is, is being harnessed. And solar energy will provide a practically inexhaustible, inexhaustible uh, so resource that will enhance sustainability, reduce pollution, and lower the cost of mitigating the climate change. So this is already happening as we see more and more uh, energy is being now produced by solar cells. So, and solar cells have become cheaper and easily accessible. Limitations in the efficiency of solar cells are being reduced by the use of innovative photonic solutions. Uh, these include availability of more radiation to the active layer where the uh, light is converted to electricity. 
efficient use of solar spectrum and longer paths of radiation in the active layer so that more and more uh, electricity can be produced. Organic materials are also increasing the applications of solar cell through a variety of new tools. On the other hand, we have uh, LEDs which are being used for lighting and LEDs are contributing to energy by saving energy. So energy saved is energy harvested. LEDs have revolutionized the lighting with efficient and low energy consumption. This we have already seen where we used to use 100 watt world. Now we are using a five or seven watt LED. Lighting represents almost 20% of global electricity consumption. This was few years back. Uh, the future development of society in both development con developed countries and emerging economies around the world are intimately tied up with the ability to effectively light our spaces, including our cities, homes, schools, and recreations. Let me just read the last one. There, there are innumerable stories how solar cells plus LED, because these two technologies are totally compatible with each other, are changing individual lives and societies around the world. You can have a standing alone solar cell with LED to create light even in remotest areas of the world. The other part where uh, photonics is actually contributing greatly to the uh, energy is through high power lasers. Lasers have truly revolutionized science and technology. High power lasers have a variety of applications in the military and industry. Today, a uh, laser is being used as a weapon to destroy enemy targets, including planes and tanks. And the latest development in high power lasers are changing the face of manufacturing by providing a new, clean, efficient way of material processing. So now, instead of welding for cutting and joining metals and other materials, today we are using uh, lasers. In fact, all the mobiles that you have in your hand are being manufactured by kind of technology and that is why you get such a smooth finish then you have uh, applications health and medicine photonic technologies provide new tools for doctors and surgeons new developments in optometry and vision science uh, to improve quality of life light-based technologies are used every day in medical diagnostics in ways that are often unaware of that we are un we are often unaware of and that is why it is important that people here using are aware of at least some basic nature of light so that they can think of new ideas. I mean, this is, this is which is becoming very important. Breakthroughs in light technology continues to revolutionize medical industry. Medical imaging, surgical procedures, and even diagnosis rely upon the use of light. We have in our department several projects with uh, in collaboration with AIMS, which are where we are using these kind of things. The other thing that is happening is lasers are especially crucial in dermatology, uh, ophthalmology, and, and dentistry due to their precision and high power density. So for you know destroying some things or for cutting or for burning, this is extremely useful. In fact, lasers are now widely used for common procedures such as tumors, tattoos, hair, and birthmark removal. Eye surgery and other uh, surgical procedures now use the power of lasers rather than the invasive methods of the past. In fact, uh, the, the eye uh, diagnostics has completely changed with the OCT and you can actually see multi uh, through, see through the layers of retina and get a very nice, good images as shown here. More recently, uh, light applications, specific lasers have been used in medical diagnosis due to their non-invasive properties, routine diagnosis such as tissue oxygenation. And here I must say, with, with this COVID, we uh, almost, uh, you know, very large number of people have this uh, finger oxygen uh, meter and it is based on optical, optical technology. This is a photonic device. Uh, if you open this and you'll see the laser light coming out from there. Uh, routine diagnosis such as tissue oxygenation, early detection of tumors by fluorescence and early detection of dental cavities are all performed by laser based medical application. So light is crucial in exploring the fundamentals of life and our surrounding environment. The overarching fields of physics and natural sciences rely on photonics technology to explore better and uh, explore and better understand our world. 
then the communication i had already uh, talked about this earlier so optical fibers are connecting the whole world uh, in in seamless way so optical fibers are extremely thin flexible transparent fibers made of silica or plastic these hair like fibers transmit light signals from one end to the other end over long distances when co-joined conjoined end to end most commonly used in telecommunication the use of light in fiber optics has revolutionized the way humans interact in the 21st century i have already spoken this earlier this is one photograph which shows how optical cable networks around india is, is spread unlike wire cables optical fibers permit transmission over long distances at high bandwidths which is cannot be done with any other technology uh, fibers are also used because signals travel through them with less loss than in metal wires and they are unaffected by electromagnetic interference so today uh, the the fidelity of uh, signal is so high that you don't hear any noise so this is the uh, effect of the uh, internet through optical fiber you see the exponential the truly exponential growth of the internet usage over the last let's say three uh, decades and uh, today 62% of the population of the world is accessing internet through optical fiber so photonics uh, being enabling technology uh, apart from all those applications it has many other for example defense applications in defense it has vision devices detection devices target annihilation for space we have cameras and sensors for industrial use for cutting sensing uh, control and lighting for energy solar cells and led lighting that we already talked about uh for science and research microscopy beyond diffraction molecular manipulation high power pulse laser of extreme intensities a new tool for creating uh, radiation and accelerated particles is something which is happening i mean one may have one would have rather uh, soon desktop uh, particle accelerators and it will not require large uh, lhc kind of devices so optics and photonics uh, it's an enabling technology we i keep saying enable technologies because it does not have a capacity to make a stand alone uh, device it requires the support of electronics or mechanical engineering and other things but it is a key thing for example in a in a laser disc reader laser is the key but there are many other things to make a device something like that so it's an enabling technology it can offer innovative solutions to many problems in society it will always be integrated with other technologies to provide full solutions a, a higher level of awareness about light and its properties is needed to aid this unless people know about this they will not be able to think of solutions through light optics and photonics at indian what is the indian scenario we have a very small rnd community general awareness is extremely poor in education the content is poor optics is not a subject at msc level except in few institutions like iits engineering curriculum has almost no photonics content whether it's electrical engineering electrical engineers may have little bit but mechanical or others have nil hardly any training at the technician level this requires change otherwise we'll let this revolution also pass by us like many others thank you so with this i would uh, once again invite you to uh, all the lectures that are going to take place manoj thank you thank you so much sir for this wonderful talk uh, we have two or three uh, quick questions yeah. uh, the first question is by uh, mr shivam mm -hmm. he asks you why light is used for calculation of time and distance maybe uh, he is asking about the light years for light is used for i mean he is asking why light is used for calculation of time and distance oh that's that's just a way of convenient thing because yeah. you know in in, in astro astronomy or astrophysics the distances are so large that this was found a convenient way that you know uh, the distance traveled by light in a particular time is taken as a distance from a light year is the one which takes light to travel in one year which as you can imagine it with with the, the 3 into 10 over 10 i think 8 meters per second this will be a huge huge number 
but uh, we are talking about even that we are talking about thousands and thousands of light years so the kind of distances this was a, just a convenient way So the next question is, uh, can you please explain factors affecting data transfer in LIFI? In light? LIFI, L-I-F-I. LIFI is a new technology which is uh, basically uh, using light which is around you through your LED bulbs and so on to communicate with your uh, devices. Uh, so a lot of progress has taken place. But there are uh, certain difficulties, for example, when you switch off uh, the light in the night, for example, then how do you communicate? This is one of the major problems that people are looking at it. But other than that, uh, for short distance, this kind of Li-Fi is, is a solution which people are uh, pursuing very heavily. And it should be, uh, it is already possible, people have experimented, I mean, this, it's not a problem, but there are only some technological issues which are, uh, which are still to be solved. Next one is uh, why solar cells are becoming cheaper and easily available day by day. Maybe they are asking okay. about the solar technology. <laughs> That's a matter of technology uh, yeah. and the volume. It's a matter of economy rather. So uh, uh, as the usage are increasing, more and more uh, volumes are being produced. So they're becoming cheaper and also the processing uh, is getting better and better. Uh, people are using uh, very thin film solar cells and other devices uh, which makes it cheaper per per watt i mean so it becomes actually basically a dollar per watt uh, kind of scenario if you see it becomes what much much cheaper it's becoming much cheaper it's both technology it's improvements in technology because people are producing better materials and better solar cells and also the volumes the kind of volumes that are being produced so uh this one is by Dr. Saroj Kumar. Mm. How one can improve the resolution optical fiber based resolution of the optical uh, fiber based sensors? Resolution. Resolution yeah. of the optical fiber based sensor. Now that will depend on what kind of technology or what kind of principle you are using. I mean, it's very difficult to give a general answer to this. Whether you are using uh, a transmutation type uh, sensor or it is a uh, you know, uh, plasmonic sensor or any other, you know, it'll depend on what kind of sensor. So basically what one has to see is that how uh, you, in a, in a sensor you have a, you have a uh, stimulus and then you have a transition and you get a new sig uh, signal in, in optical domain, uh, how this ratio can be improved. That is the thing. So that will depend on uh, what kind of sensor you are using. It's difficult to give a, a very generalized answer to this. Sir, another question is, uh, what are your views about institutes such as ICER to increase the general awareness about optics and photonics as it mainly focuses on research? <laughs> no, no, no. Focus is research, but you do a lot of courses. What I would suggest is that all engineers should do at least one course in one basic course in photonics and all scientists must do that also uh, including biological scientists because you know uh, optics and photonics are providing solutions to many many problems and now i mean i i and i sort of sometimes get so surprised to uh, you know when i talk to this even the school teachers or even college teachers that how poor their knowledge about optics is you know they even basic things they do not understand and then it, then i get a little bothered, bothered. although they are, these are usually physics teachers which we have gone through some course in optics but you know uh, usually optics is taught only at up to the level of bsc which is mostly geometrical optics and a little bit of diffraction or interference not more than that uh, which is which is very little actually there are many many more things which have to be uh, basic things have to be done so one can design a, a, a basic course. We used to have one course like this at IIT, really for engineers, uh, which is not there right now, but uh, which was very good course. You know, I taught many times, uh, which had you know uh, given baseline information about photonics to which an engineer should know. That kind of course should be there. 
that I'll take up the last one. Hmm. Uh, do solar panels use toxic elements that can possibly leach out? Uh, not aware. Um, <laughs> I mean, solar cells are usually made of silicon, uh, but uh, but there may be many other uh, materials which are as, as a base or in, in in glue or in you know in many technologies. So I am exactly not aware whether uh, that's more of a materials question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for this wonderful, lightful talk. Thank you so okay. much.